Uh, yeah, so I'm John Fitzgerald from the International Computer Science Institute, and we are part of Parlab because we're sort of one of a couple of people that try to make applications out of what the Parallel Lab does. And you're going to hear now four talks of exactly these people um, that um, sort of make up, you know, an application uh, user uh, front for Parlab. Um, basically, in other words, you've heard three days about how to do stuff. Now you're going to hear, I like, in a one-hour session of when you, if you use that stuff, what will actually happen and uh, what does it, how does it re actually really help you. So I'm going to start um, the one of the four talks with what we call the meeting diarist. And it's actually really surprising um, what, what came out of it. First, though, I should, um, I should tell you what the meeting diarist is. So here's the thing. Everybody has meetings all the time. So the idea here was that instead of... Um, transcribing meetings manually, sort of what was in my meeting, what was in my lecture, you would go ahead and have a computer record the meeting. For example, an iPhone, and in fact, that is an iPhone recorded meeting. Um, and then later on, you can recapture what was said in the meeting. Except, who wants to listen to an entire boring meeting after the fact? So what you want to do is you want to be able to search, for example, for keywords, you know, what did David Patterson say about caches, for example, or you want to be able to say, well, actually, I just want to hear the audience questions or, or these kind of things, or just what did, you know, this guy say about X. And this is what we call the meeting diarist. So it creates you a, a uh, quick access to a recorded meeting. And so technically, the meeting diarist entails lots of components, speaker diarization, is the component basically that I'm going to talk about today. That's the, um, yeah, that's the component that finds out who spoke when. But then there's also speech recognition, of course, so you have to find out what were the words that were speaking. Then you attribute this, you find out who said what, and then you can do on that more intelligence and basically find out, you know, um, you know how, who said what more often or were there other noises and so on. I'm going to quickly show you a demo if I have time in the end. So now let's talk about speaker diarization, So the, the algorithm that we have, what it's supposed to do is you have a random audio track, you don't know anything about it, nothing. You don't know what language is speaking, whether there's language in there, you don't know how many speakers, um, uh, you don't know the words that were spoken or something like that, you just get the audio track. And the, the algorithm is supposed to do is gives you uh, segments of what the speech is and then in the second step it gives you um, a clustering saying this is all the same speaker and you know this is all the same speaker, speaker A, B, C. And as a side effect, of course, you get the number of speakers out of there. And to, do, to build such an engine is actually, uh, you know, 10 years of research uh, at ICSI. Um, it's, you know, a, a big thing where you have, you know, all kinds of filters up front, feature extraction, initialization, of course, speech, non-speech detection is part of it. You have to find out which parts are actually speech, which parts are non-speech. And since I only have 15 minutes, I can't talk about all of this. I will only talk about the la last part, the, the very part where you basically get those speech segments in, and they have to be um, sorted so that you find out you know, label who's, who's speaking when, so do you do speaker A, B, C label. And so the, the core of the algorithm, of course, I can't even explain you the complete algorithm today, but the core of the algorithm works like this. You have an initialization, you start with a random assignment of speakers, and in fact, more importantly, you start with an assignment that contains many more speakers than you think will be in the meeting. So if you have a meeting of four to six people, you start with something like 16 random assignments. And these, yeah, these were like the random assignments. Since I don't want to make this too complicated for the slide, I just start with three. So you have three uh, random assignments, and we don't do it completely randomly, it's uniform. And then you go do some training, and what you train is Gaussian mixture models. You basically take from each of, like each segment, you train a Gaussian mixture model, so you have three Gaussian mixture models for this initial segmentation. Uh, yeah, these are my Gaussian mixture models. And then, based on the Gauss mixture models, you now ask, okay, given the models, let's re-observe our observations and find out which of, the, which of the clusters are actually now, how does the new clustering look like? And then you get some new clustering. 
using that new class train, um, you ha have to ask yourself now, okay, and this is the most important step, you purify the clusters. Basically, you want the models to actually reflect each speaker. Um, and so what you say is, okay, now that I have sort of these impure clusters, maybe, and because we started with many more clusters than we have speakers, maybe two clusters represent more like one speaker. And basically you find two clusters to merge, and that's what you then do. You merge those clusters, you end up with two clusters, and then you do a realignment of that, and then you have two clusters, and you do that until you don't find any clusters anymore. It's a typically agglomerative clustering approach. And again, I can't go into detail of why this works and why we do this, but I'm going to give you a, uh, an out on the last slide. Um, more important for you here is we, we started with five versions of this code. First version, 2006, was about one third real time. That means for 10 minutes of a meeting, we needed 30 minutes of processing. Second version was a little bit more optimized. We did all kinds of neat, trick, neat tricks. And then we went to 1.5 times real time. That means for 10 minutes of a meeting, you needed about seven and a half minutes of processing time. And then we had different retreats in Parlab, and we found out that, well, first of all, we can use sort of, we can parallelize it. And the first parallelized version was about 14.3 times real time. That means, again, for 10 minutes of a meeting, you need way less than a minute to, to do the thing. And then later on, we actually did a GPU parallelized version uh, which was then uh, about 250 times real time. That meant one hour of audio equals 14.4 seconds of processing. So now the question is, it's fast, but what does that mean? Um, and one thing it meant we could make the code easier, but first of all, uh, let me show you what that actually means in comparison if you, if you show this. So I did a little, uh, here's a little demo. So this is the initial version that was serially optimized over two years. This is the version which is multi-core, and this is the version which is uh, GPU optimized. So while this is starting with an initialization, you know, I'm, I'm starting having this run, I run the other multi-core version, which takes about a minute, and then now please pay attention, I'm going to the GPU window and start the GPU version, and you're gonna see while this is still <coughs> sort of beginning segmentation, you run this and you're done. Right, so this is, the first experience that you get when you do these kind of things. That is absolutely way much faster than you, you ever thought. Um, but again, now it's fast, so what? So first of all, yeah, cool. Now you can uh, say, well, now that I can run like 200 times faster, 250 times faster, I can leverage all this time and try to get high accuracy by doing more iterations or more complicated things. Sure, but this will be true with, with, with any speed up. And then also, you can run it on much more data. Now we have these large-scale data tasks in the multimedia community. For example, TrackVid is now 50K videos. That wouldn't have been possible when you, when you need like three times real time. Good luck. Um, and also, given more data, as, as, as typical machine learning, you will have more accuracy. But then, um, it's also interesting, again, this, all this stuff is interesting for other applications as well. But, um, more importantly, we, we found out, wow, actually, since it's so fast, it's sort of like a basic filter operation. So what we were able to do is we said, you know, there was a long outstanding problem in the community that do I actually want to find out who spoke when? Maybe. But wouldn't it be even cooler if my cell phone that I used in the meeting and is recording would tell me right away who is speaking now? So basically, do it all online. And there was a whole bunch of papers, dozen of papers at, at least, in the community about how can I work around the speed issues and how can I buffer it really right and create models online. All we need to do now is, because the diarization is so fast, we can run it on a two minute video, like initially, and then we can run it every 2.5 seconds on a larger and larger and larger window. And that means that every 2.5 seconds I have an online result of who's speaking now. Of course, 2.5 seconds is still some delay, but the point is here, no further, I mean, there's a little bit of more logic in there, but basically I can use the offline version, what used to take into account, um, uh, you know, had, had, to, had, to be ta had to take out all the data from, from, from the beginning to the end of the meeting and then run, can now run like on the fly. 
Um, and this is basically, yeah, we did some experiments to find out when, when it would um, be converging. So we, we did this, and then we found out, um, yeah, all these papers that try to do all kinds of workaround to make this possible are now obsolete because I can just use uh, the engine as is parallelized and run it. So now, you know, what was sort of an engine and the thing that was researched for 10 years becomes like a trivial matrix filter operation, not because it's easy and less complex, no, because it's just super fast. Um, the problem is there was um, still lots of brain power needed um, and we call it efficiency layer solution. So that lots of brain power needed um, um, to, to implement all this. Um, and it was highly specialized. It only works on CUDA. And if you, if you work with that, you'll see every version is a little different and so on. And so um, we said, can we also use, um, yeah, there's also feature extraction. I'm not talking about all these other, other stuff. But there was another thing that came up, we said, okay, so now we have that solution that's super cool. It's online, it's super fast, but you know, it needs a PhD to understand it. So can we, can we not also use the fact that it's super fast to do something else, mainly making it all simpler? And so we did something, so there's this project, you heard about it on one slide I heard from Jim, it's called CJITS, and the idea is that all the bottleneck code, everything that's really hard to execute uh, in terms of complexity and, and speed, will run on, the, on CUDA or some parallelized version. And the other part that is sort of my conceptual part that needs tuning and that I have to play around with a lot, uh, will work on a productivity language that's some scripting language, for example, Python. And that's exactly what we did. And that's kind of cool. So everything that I said is so complex in 10 years of research is now sort of can be expressed in this. This is the complete product code. Um, of course, it's not exactly everything because, yes, there are a couple of calls in that code that will use CUDA, um, but the thing is that these are pretty generic. This is basically GMM training, which can be reused for all kinds of things. And all the tuning, all the experimenting, all the stuff that actually we want to work with to make these things better is now in the productivity language. Um, so in conclusion, um, uh, there are two, uh, I mean, the, the main message for this is, uh, again, I, I couldn't go into a lot of details because I'm, I'm running out of time in 50 minutes, but what I wanted to, to give you as a message is parallelization allows for more than just an incremental speed up. It introduces new possibilities on how to approach a problem, and we saw those papers that were sort of obsoleted. Um, First of all, higher level languages and the speed up make experimenting easier, which is really, you know, making researchers' life easier is a feature. And then the algorithm can iterate more often. That means we can increase the accuracy. Uh, also, we have other research on speech recognition where we increase the accuracy of speech recognition because now you have like 200 times more time to do the same thing. Um, and also, what I found most important is that due to the speed up, the task specific optimization can be avoided. Like, again, all these papers that try to make it online by working around the speed issues, now basically forget them. You can just do it parallel and then um, uh, you have a generic solution. Um, so um, before I hopefully give you a minute of a demo, I want to say, so if you now think that was interesting <laughs> or after the talk, I have a, a CS298 class, which I call Acoustic Methods for Video Analysis, it's Fridays from 1.30 to 3 p.m. in 3.20 soda. And there, you know, I promise you that after you've gone there, you will understand what we actually did and why we actually did it this way. Um, you know, because in a 15-minute talk, and I, I totally agree, it was probably sort of voodoo. Um, and more information is on my web page. So let me show you a little demo. Um, I thought I'd pick a little more exciting meeting um, namely a sitcom, because in fact, if you think about it, uh, you know, some actors meeting in front of a camera is not so different from, uh, from other things uh, that happen, you know, everywhere, except it's more structured and it's higher quality, so you can actually more easily process it. And so that's what we did. For example, we, we, we knew that in a sitcom, punchlines are followed by laughter. So what do you do? You detect laughter and you see, for example, this is a punchline. I don't think so. No. Anecdotal evidence suggests that in a game of rock, paper, scissors, players familiar with each other will tie 75 to 80% of the time due to the limited number of outcomes. 
I suggest rock, paper, scissors, lizard, Spock. Yeah, so that's, you know, what you can do is that, and then you go to your top, pi top five punchlines, what is the most important jokes. You could go to the scene breaks, because every scene starts with this music, so for example... Okay, that's... All right, will you... Yeah, you see the... I'm going out for a while. So, and then, and then you can basically say, oh, I don't care about all the other actors, but I'm really into Sheldon. And then you click away all the other actors, and then you only get the punchlines by Sheldon, for example, as you can see here. So that's, that's the idea of, of a diarizing, of a diarist. And uh, again, um, uh, we're working on this uh, in parallel because it gives us all kinds of interesting advantages. Um, thank you. Questions? OK, we have time for one, maybe two brief questions before uh, the next person goes up. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Okay. Good afternoon, my name is Tony Keaveny. I'm a professor of mechanical engineering and bioengineering. And I'm working with a number of researchers in the PAR lab to try and apply principles of computational uh, mechanics to medical problems. So, my particular expertise is in the area of biomechanics. I study stresses and forces acting in the skeleton. And I do so in the context, ultimately, of addressing important medical problems. So what we're trying to do here at a very high level is combine computation with medical imaging. And that can be done in a number of ways, but then what I get involved is we try and add into that some physiological modeling associated with biomechanics to ultimately provide more useful information from the medical image than a radiologist ordinarily gets just by looking at the medical image. And ultimately then, this should lead to improved diagnostics and improved surgical planning. And I'll explain some of the significance of that. So I got into this work doing osteoporosis work at a very basic science level. I had no applications to any kind of clinical uh, problems in a direct sense. We were looking at mechanisms of osteoporotic fractures using very, very high resolution images of cadaver bones that were converted into finite element models that we would virtually crush and look in the regions of the bone where the microstructure fails. So these red bars here are the, the individual small pieces of bone that are failing when the, when the vertebra is compressed. That's a 2D slice from a, from a human vertebra. So these computational models had on the order of 500 million elements, which is about a billion degrees of freedom. And we worked closely with Jim Demmel and Mark Adams to pull off the computation using massively parallel techniques. And at a, um, we won the, the, the Gordon Bell Prize. Yeah, Mark Adams won that in, in 2004 for that work. So that was very basic work. And in parallel with this, we were looking at much coarser models to see if we could get insight into bone strength from doing analysis that with much fewer degrees of freedom. And here's an example, this is a little fuzzy image here, but here's an example of a model. This is just showing a 3D version of, of, of basically a, a vertebra, where the voxel sizes, instead of being on the order of 20 microns over here, they're about a millimeter here. And these can be obtained from, from clinical CT scans. This you have to do micro CT on a, on a dead piece of bone. And we first published our paper on this in 2003. It was published in this uh, research journal, Bone. And the editor put this um, tagline on it, predicting vertebral strength and vertebral fractures from bench to bedside. That's a real cliche in medical. Um, and we only analyzed 14 bones when we published this paper, but it caused a bit of a splash. And a lot of pharmaceutical companies came to us and said, we want to do that in our clinical trials of new drugs to see if you can tell us how bone strength has been changed in people while they're on these new drug treatments. And that was very exciting. So we formed a company to start doing this because it's impossible to do any kind of study in a university with any significant level of quality control on how the analysis are done. I'm sure you guys are aware of the multitude versions of codes that you probably have on your laptop as we speak. 
So um, we started this company and this is a paper that was published by the company in 2008 where the same type of analysis has now been translated over to a clinical journal. So you go to the doctor's office about your arthritis and you're, you're liable to see this on the, on the bench. And then we're expecting to get FDA approval of this uh, later this year. So this has been the story of going from very high parallelized computation down to something much more feasible clinically, but integrating it with clinical factors to actually show up as something that can be used clinically. So hopefully your aunts and your moms and everybody in a few years from now, if they're worried about osteoporosis, there'll be something better on the market than what is currently there. In this project, we wanted to get into something much more dramatic and we actually wanted to try and save people's lives. So we identified a completely different medical application where you could bring computation to the table. So here is, uh, it's a problem of stroke. Stroke is the number three killer in this country, about 150,000 deaths every year. During the course of this presentation, if you do the numbers, there'll be about 15 strokes in the United States and about five people who have those strokes or four or five people will die. Our goal in this project is to reduce the number of deaths from stroke and to reduce the complications from stroke. Currently, if you have a stroke and you go to the hospital three to four hours after having the stroke, which 80% of people do, because half people get the stroke in the middle of the night and most other people don't know what's happening, you arrive to the hospital after three or four hours, they will not treat you. You will be diagnosed and managed, but you won't actually be given any treatment to change the course of outcomes. And fingers crossed that the stroke will resolve itself or you won't die. The most um, applicable treatment right now is a blood thinner, but they won't give you the blood thinner unless you come in within three hours of having a stroke because the risk of having a burst blood vessel as a result of the blood thinner is too high. So what we want to do is risk stratify patients after they've been diagnosed for stroke, to try and identify those who are either at very high risk of having an aneurysm, having a burst blood vessel, or at very low risk of having an aneurysm. And the idea would be that you can treat those. The ones that are at very high risk, hell, you've got nothing to lose. The ones who are at very low risk, there should be no complications from the blood thinner. And in that way, we want to change the practice of medicine from deciding to treat based on the clock to deciding to treat based on our physiological modeling of the blood flow in your brain. So the uh, interesting thing about stroke is, is uh, you have this branch of uh, arteries in your brain called the circle of Willis where most of the strokes occur. So you get a blockage and then it cuts the blood supply off locally which leads to brain damage. That's called ischemia. But the, the thing that will kill you is a downstream event where there's overloading of blood and you can actually burst the blood vessel. So our plan is to extract out your vasculature from the CT scan that's taken to diagnose your stroke, simulate blood flow in that, and hopefully we can identify people who have some severe disruption of the blood flow or very minimal disruption of the blood flow. So that's the idea. We have to do clinical studies. One of the interesting things about your brain is that uh, this circle of Willis looks nice on paper, but only about half people have textbook circle of Willis. Most of the rest of the population have some perturbation like a missing, a missing vessel in the middle of it. So you have tremendous heterogeneity in your vasculature in the brain. And of course, these strokes can occur at different locations. So you put the two together and you have what we think is the, the perfect storm for um, the convergence of an unusual anatomy with a bad luck placement of the stroke to generate very different changes in the blood flow across the population. The, so, the so we take the patient CT scan in the ER, that's sent to us, and then we do our blood flow analysis, we look at stresses, we risk stratify, and we send a report to the doctor. And the challenge here, the computational challenge, is this has to be done, all of these steps have to be done in 60 seconds. So that's what we're going for. If, if you go into the stroke, the, neuro, the neurologists have a phrase, time is brain. And every minute they spend is another minute that your brain is doing without blood and, and you're, you're deteriorating on the table. So they need to get something done very, very rapidly. So this is the challenge and we are um, working on that. There's two components to that. There's the image processing and the actual blood flow simulation. And the idea is that we started the CT scan, do the image processing in here, and then out comes the medical report. 
our strategy for developing the technology is to do everything first in MATLAB and pre-existing code like VTK and then uh, convert it ultimately into some parallelized version and we're working with the CGITS framework um, so that we can get the computational time down um, substantially. And the model we're using to, to, to simulate the blood flow is essentially a 1D model of your vasculature. We're going to extract all the information from the CT scan and fit it to this kind of one-dimensional flat model of your vasculature. So we put in the cross-sectional area and the lengths of all these segments of your idealized vasculature. And then we simulate blood going in. It's like a virtual stress test. And then we look at the outflow conditions and we're trying to quantify how much the blood flow has been disrupted. And that's what we're hoping will actually be predictive. So, of course, we're doing a clinical study where we will apply this to a number of patients and we'll know the clinical outcomes of those patients and we'll be able to tell whether or not we're able to predict who goes on to have uh, either these catastrophic events or not. And then we'd follow up with a second clinical study to actually quantify its efficacy. In terms of the computational size, I'll just give you a couple of details and then wrap it up. Um, the image processing currently takes us about two hours if you were just to do good old traditional MATLAB or even sophisticated MATLAB with, with some C coding. We need to get that down to 30 seconds. And the blood flow analysis itself, um, in order to get to 30 seconds, we have to get this kind of, um, of throughput on the computation. So um, because of these considerations, this is an interesting problem. The bone problem that I started working on, we, we did the complicated problem first. We did the problem with a billion degrees of freedom first and learned about some of the biomechanics. And then we said, hey, can we get that down to something that could be used clinically? This problem, we're saying, forget the high-resolution model. We are going directly to something that's clinical, and everything we set up is designed to help us reach these performance goals. So that's why we're reducing the vasculature down to this flat, uh, almost one-dimensional representation, because if you were to do the full three-dimensional <coughs> problem, you couldn't do it in any reasonable amount of time. So it's, it's interesting that the... the uh, the physiological model is determined by the computation um, and everything is, is planned with reaching those computational goals. Um, image processing, I won't, I won't bore you with the details. We can, uh, it's got all the elements of, of uh, some of the parallel motifs that you've been hearing about and uh, we want to bring some machine learning into the image processing so it's, it's got lots of nice challenging problems. And there's a lot of people involved in this. I haven't mentioned any of the uh, six or eight undergraduates we, we have um, coming in and out of the project. So it's, it's been going on for about two years. We're getting close to actually analyzing some patients. We're, we're hoping to do that in the fall. And next year at the boot camp, I should have some clinical data to share with you. Okay, thank you for your attention. I'm Ross Boric. Um, I'll speak about uh, some fragments from the parallel web browser project. The parallel web browser project wants to accelerate browsers which have become the platform for implementing applications on laptops and increasingly more on the phone, but they are too computationally demanding. So to give them more performance, since CPUs are not getting faster, we resort to parallelism. So a quick overview of, of the project, what you see on the right is the typical stack of the web browser. You parse the HTML and CSS create a DOM, which is the tree representing the document. Uh, you apply CSS rule on it, which tells you how you actually are supposed to lay out the document. Then we perform the layout, which is computing the sizes and positions of all the elements, images, glyphs, paragraphs. And then you actually, in rendering, push the bits to the screen. So I won't tell you about the parallel algorithms today. I will tell you that we actually generate them. So there is a parser generator a generator of a parallel layout engine that takes a specification of the CSS language, that is what you may think is HTML, how the web is laid out. And this, this generator of layout engine takes various optimization, which then embeds into this layout engine. Uh, what I want to talk about is what this architecture actually enables. So we are not only looking at how to make the browser faster, but how to change how people program on the web. And uh, in, in that, I'll, I'll tell you about the language based on constraints designed for graphical designers, for visualization people, which we then compile into 
the generator of these layout, parallel layout engines. So I want to tell you, uh, if I can find a pen, I will tell here it is, um, about how you program here, and I won't tell much about how this path here actually happens, but I'll show you a little demo of the language. Okay, so the programmers we have in mind are designers, people who design visualizations of data like that. And the process of visualizing this is essentially about layout, how you package those boxes together and how you animate them to say, show the timeline. Right? Here I can demo it based on the actual program developed by New York Times designers, which shows how the, no, thank you. Uh, how the capitalization of banks changed over time, how they shrank and how they grew, how some of them actually disappeared, some of them merged. And uh, so, so this is sort of the roughly the domain that we want to support. Turns out that, that GUIs and documents also fall into this category, but visualization is more fun. So today, if you want to design such a visualization, you have essentially two options. You pick a layout that is pre-canned. Essentially, somebody can design this tree map for you, and all you do is supply it with data and maybe configure the colors. And so you are limited to the visualizations that you can, that somebody prepared for you, some programmer. If you are a programmer, of course, then your options are broader and you can design your own layout engines to do other layouts. But that may take a few days and an amount of code you need to write compared to the canned layout written in a DSL for visualization maybe at least 10 times more. So this three layout could take you a weekend to debug. So we want to make it easier for designers and we'll give you a declarative language. Declarative because these designers often know how things should be, how they should look like, but, but not how actually they should be computed. So they know the outcome, the what of their computations, but not how the computation should be performed. And uh, in the long term, we want to actually do it by demonstration. So the designers would show us how the layout should look like by actually drawing it rather than by writing down constraints. And from that, we infer the constraints and compile it. Uh, so our compiler does synthesis. You could say, why not just call an off-the-shelf constraint solver and figure out what the layout, which is positions and sizes, are. Turns out that that would not be fast enough. We really want a layout that can process images that have not 10 banks, but perhaps tens of thousands of nodes and do animations in them. So do it 60 times per second. So the result of the computation we do is a tree traversal. The tree would have nodes for everything that you want to display. And by passing over the tree several times, you compute these positions. So there will be no surge, no backtracking as it happens in general uh, so constraint solver engines. And of course, we can do the tree traversals in parallel. So how does the, the designer think about writing this program? So imagine he or she wants to prepare a map, tree map like this. So the key idea is that, you know, the designer observes that uh, the area is uh, proportional to market capitalization, that companies are stacked vertically, or in, there is another component where it is horizontally, and they are stacked on top of each other, and that the area of the parent completely encompasses the children. So essentially the area of the parent equals uh, the sum of the areas of the children. So this is what the designer needs to decide and, and I'll show you how they encode it in our language. So what is the language? So this is hello world of that language. You need to know that the document is a tree. So in, in HTML syntax it would look like this but you probably want to view it that way. And once visualized these boxes B and C are encompassed in the box A that we want to actually uh, render. Now, so the document is a tree data structure. We want to write constraints. The constraints are local in the sense that they put together the constraint of the parent with the constraint of the child. So this box with the two boxes. And here we say that the width of the children, C and B, equals one half of the width of the parent. So you are dividing the width in half. So this is a local constraint. Keep in mind that this does not tell you how you actually compute the constraints. Is it from child to the parent or vice versa? This direction, the propagation of values will be computed by our compiler or synthesizer, whichever you want to call it. So now in order to define tree map in this language, we need to 
define two components, horizontal and vertical one, which are those that put things together uh, vertically versus horizontally, well, the other way around. And so how do we do it? So remember what the designer had in mind. So there are four things he wants to say. That V is a rectangle in some style, meaning it has some color, some dotted line. Uh, the area is divided vertically among children. The children are stacked on top of each other as opposed to having a gap. And the area is proportional to the sums of children capitalization. So how do we write it in the language? Well, uh, the first constraint is here. Essentially, it says we have a vertical division that the height is the sum of children's heights and the width of the parent equals the width of each of the children. The second constraint says that there is vertical stacking. See, the first child at the top is zero in relative coordinates of the parent and the second child, its top equals the bottom of the first child. The height is the bottom of the first child. And finally, we say that uh, the area, h times v, equals the capitalization times some suitably chosen constant which we can adjust to make the map bigger or smaller. So these are the constraints. Now using those constraints, we are ready to define the v component and the h component, which is a composition of each of them five different traits or aspects or whatever you want to call them. And here I put together the vertical division, the stacking, the tree map, and there are two from the library which essentially say what a box does and what are relative coordinates. These are predefined for all of us to use. And now with that, we can define our document. And are we done? Well, not yet. The, our synthesizer will come back to us and tell us that your tree map is under constraint because given the constraints you can give me, I can lay it out like this or like that. Turns out that we did not quite specify uniquely what the layout is. So as you can see, the designer can observe that the aspect ratio is not quite determined. So the designer, based on this feedback, gives more constraints. And one way to fix it is to define the height of the root window, or you could set the aspect ratio. So given the semantics, we have some de user-friendly debugging and some predictable layout. And so now I can show you a demo. And in this demo, we have a map which shows the number of court cases in front of the various uh, federal district. So this is nine districts. I wish this was bigger, but it's not. And we'll animate between these two layouts which show the number of cases in 1980 and 2000, something like this. Um, so as I click on this, this will animate. And what do you see? That it doesn't animate quite smoothly, and that's because what we generate here is a simple sequential JavaScript layout engine. What we need is now generate one that is parallel and runs either in JavaScript or perhaps in native C++ so that the computation of the layout is fast enough. So we have the ability to generate layout engine that's fast, but the use of JavaScript somewhat limits us, but it still serves as a good demo. I could show you on a different machine how it runs much faster on a, on a C++ in Palo. Uh, so what I also want to show you here is that, if you look here, here is the actual program it essentially, what you see here is the entire program, all the constraints that we had to write. What we generate from it, uh, is the layout engine, which is here, and here are the functions that traverse the tree and compute the sizes, including some debugging. So from relatively short constraints, we generate quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of layout engine uh, code. So uh, a few other things to note about the language that is built on the layout engine generator is that it allows the designer easily experiment with the layout. For example, if the designer wants, as we did, to fix the height and width, right? If you notice in the animation, we did have a fixed area between the animations. He just fixes h and v to particular values. And the tools tells us that you need to make the scaling factor a variable rather than constant so that it is computed by the layout engine. Otherwise, the layout will be over-constrained. And finally, how animation is done, this is not as important. But uh, what I want to show you is that if you want to do other layouts, and here we have a radial one, all you need to do is define a new trait with polar coordinates, which are based on angles rather than on uh, essentially stacking of boxes. So we are not limited to box layouts. And again, a layout engine will fall out, 
And if we can have a C++ of native substrate, it will also be fast and parallel. So with that, what do we do? Uh, on the parallel substrate of the browser, we can now support declarative programming for things that you want to run fast on a lot of data with high animation frame rate and uh, do it for data visualization, GUIs, and perhaps documents too. Uh, this is essentially fast layout for big data and small battery where we want to run fast because that is energy efficient. And we do it by not searching and running, uh, calling a, a, a constraint solver, but instead through efficient tree traversals in parallel. And uh, I didn't tell you how the actual translation from these constraints happen, but essentially all of these constraints on a per node basis are translated into all possible functions, thinking if I have these values, I can compute the others. And then globally, we stitch those functions into a layout engine that can walk across the tree in several passes and compute all variables. And uh, with that, I'll stop and take a few questions. That's a linear programming solver to, to satisfy these constraints? No, the, the solver is actually uh, a tree traversal. So we generate a solver that, given a tree of constraints, the tree corresponding to the document, performs a few traversals and just essentially propagates these values. So it doesn't do any uh, linear programming. It's all custom efficiently generated, no backtracking. Uh, the only time when we call a custom solver is during debugging, when we are trying to figure out whether the constraints are over and under constraints, and if they're under constraints, we ask the solver for two distinct examples of layout to give a hint of where the lack of constraints might be. But otherwise, the constraints we do is essentially attribute grammar evaluation, if we are familiar with that from compilers. That's the layout engine that we generate, which is why it is so efficient, because all it does is simple tree traversals. Okay, I'm David Wessel, and uh, I'm in charge of the uh, musical applications that we're doing in the Par Lab. Now, you might wonder right away, what in the world are we doing with music in the Par Lab? I mean, why would that be a, uh, an app? Well, it turns out that uh, there's some really special demands that are made. For, and, well, first of all, there are Musical applications are quite popular. Uh, there are probably a million users of Ableton Live, and that's just one of many uh, digital, audio, digital audio workstations. And, uh, you know, Apple Ships, uh, GarageBand, and so on. So music is a, uh, on the minds of a lot of people, and they want to um, use their computers to do it effectively. Now, the other thing that's interesting about the musical applications is that they really demand real-time performance. And so we want the operating system work that we're doing to service uh, real-time. And uh, the real-time performance has to be of a very low latency. So arguments about throughput or bandwidth and that sort of thing uh, don't fly. We really want to think about how to get computation done on time in a timely manner. You know, when you, when you uh, reason about uh, bandwidth and so on, you've, you've got a numerator and in denominator, you see, so much processing in so much time. And oftentimes that time span that people use is fairly large. It might be a month, it might be a minute. But we, our time spans are on the order of, you know, 100 microseconds. So that's, that's where we want, um, we want to think of our latency in, 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 at that, in that, on that kind of time scale. This morning uh, we had a, a session with the uh, people who are, some people from Apple, some people from uh, uh, Meyer Sound and so on, about a new audio standard, which is called the Ethernet Audio Video Bridge. And uh, th their uh, time is, it, it, this is a time-sensitive protocol that runs over Ethernet and will probably be the major protocol for distributing media in homes and f first to professional things. But there, again, the, the window over which we measure something like throughput is 125 microseconds. So the other thing that's really critical about musical applications is that most of the computer music community has 
an insatiable, really insatiable appetite for computation. Uh, I'm always, in my own work, I'm always running out of processor capacity and really want more. And of course, we know now that the only way to get more is to go parallel. So we've got some really special constraints, high computational load. We want low latency and timely behavior. And uh, we've got this insatiable appetite. Now, there are lots of different kinds of uh, applications. Uh, you know, there are everything from Guitar Hero through elaborate music information retrieval. We're also interested in what's going on in the hearing augmentation industry or the hearing aid industry. There was going to be some, there's room for lots of processing, and we've done some pr uh, projects involving parallelism with Starkey, which is a major hearing aid manufacturer. And then uh, working with Meyer Sound with uh, very large uh, speaker arrays and so on, where a lot of signal processing needs to be done, again, in a timely manner. The delivery is essential. Uh, the low latency delivery, again, is very, very uh, important. So uh, these are, this is the standard sort of digital audio workstation setup. Now, what's important about these uh, kinds of things is that they are built on a kind of stream, streaming audio structure or a um, multiple tracks, multiple layers, multiple voices, whatever you might want to call them. And uh, they're typically set up so that these uh, tracks and lines and voices and so on can uh, operate on different cores. So you might say there are a lot of places in, in music that parallelism can just come into play very easily. Uh, if you think about the way a musical score is laid out, you'll have the various instruments on separate lines, and what's remarkable is the conductor's job to coordinate their activity, but they don't really necessarily have much in the way of communication across those lines. Of course, they do synchronize and so on, and, and performance practice is involved, but the data itself is fairly easy to manage in a parallel manner. So um, one of the other things that characterizes a, a lot of the musical applications is the use of plugins or uh, components that uh, can be incorporated into the digital audio workstation or the uh, programming language that you're using. So these, if you looked out on the web and looked for uh, VST-type plugins or audio unit plugins, uh, uh, Ladspot plugins, which are available, for, which are plugins or, oriented towards the Linux operating system. Um, you see, there are just thousands of them, and people like to compose uh, the uh, their audio applications, the kinds of effects and so on that they're going to be using uh, with these plugins. Now. One thing that's uh, troublesome about all of this is many of these plugins aren't thread safe, so there, there are some difficulties that might arise there from, you know, uh, problems of concurrency bugs and so on. And uh, the other thing is the threading ecologies that are used in different plugins f to get things to work in parallel uh, might, in fact, not be compatible with each other or with the main operating system. For example, in Ableton Live, which is a very popular digital audio workstation, uh, it can be set up so that the different tracks and so on run on different cores, different threads, essentially. But if you were to introduce another component inside that was used a different threading ecology, let's say you put an open, you used OpenMP in a uh, <coughs> in a uh, plugin, well there might be some catastrophic, really, uh, conflicts where the, the threading, uh, the thread ecologies are competing with each other and uh, resources are getting oversubscribed and so on. So this is why we think very strongly that some kind of collaborative thread management is really essential to making things work together, to make them be uh, composable <coughs> so they can appropriately share hardware resources. Excuse me while I lubricate. Uh, 
my voice. Okay, so along with the uh, the work on you know paralyzing things that could run on typical OSs, we're actually developing a new operating system called Tessellation, and Tessellation is provides performance guarantees, and one of the key um, ideas uh, behind tessellation is the partitioning of the hardware resources into cells, and these cells are isolated one from another, so that uh, you can get very close to bare metal in one cell, you could have other kinds of uh, different scheduling uh, policies and so on in different cells, and they won't uh, interfere with each other. The other important idea here re related to this is the life that sort of uh, application-aware, low-level resource partitioning. This is the way we can get and avoid many of these conflicts. So it turns out that one of the really interesting areas in the whole thing is what we do with I.O., how we get stuff into the, the uh, music system, and then how we get it out. And on the into side, on the interface side, We've been working with uh, controllers of various kinds, multi-touch arrays, and uh, when we work with these controllers, we've got to analyze the gestures that are given to them. On the left here, uh, this is a controller we've developed in-house at the Center for New Music and Audio Technologies. It has uh, 32 touch pads on it, which are sen each of which is sensitive to X, Y, and pressure. Now, rather than send these data from these pads as discrete events uh, in an asynchronous protocol, we send them in a synchronous protocol. In fact, it's, again, uh, just like the audio stream, and then we take it apart inside of the application. On the output side, we've been working with loudspeakers. In fact, if you come over to our room, in uh, over at 1750 Arch, you'll see that we're actually running 141 channels of audio into the room. With, we have, 100 and we have a, a number of speaker arrays. They're all operational at the same time. And then our, on the microphone side, we're actually using 144 channels of input in a spherical mi microphone array. So we have very high channel count input and output to deal with. And again, there's a lot of parallel, inherent parallelism here. Uh, each channel can be treated separately, uh, and in in many instances is is um, not communicating with the, the channels that are adjacent to it. Are they're all independent and uh, from each other, so that, that there aren't any really sneaky hidden dependencies to cause trouble. Now, there's another area of music work that's also receiving a lot of attention. In some respects, maybe more, uh, if, you, if you look at these music tech conferences and so on that are going on here in San Francisco and you look at uh, what people are doing in what's called music information retrieval, there's a very large project like this at Google uh, right now, and uh, people are trying to, you know, understand music in such a way that they can make recommendations, that they can generate playlists for people, they can... Um, perhaps understand what's going on in the music itself, ca characterize it, and so on. So th these are some of the uh, various um, uh, wh wh reasons why you would want to get music information retrieval. Well, it turns out that uh, um, <laughs> there's room for a lot of parallelism here, and we need, of course, some fairly high-powered um, uh, processing to do this. Let me just walk through one example. Here, here are the ideas we want to... This is work by graduate student uh, Eric Battenberg and, uh, in, in the PAR lab. And so what he wants to do is track uh, audio and find the beat. In other words, he wants to actually extract the drums from the background and then uh, eventually figure out uh, to what it how the drum is, how the drummer is actually playing. So, in order to do this source, this is an auditory scene analysis problem. You're trying to separate out some uh, instrument from a, a background, or in the case of speech, you might be trying to separate out the speech from other speakers in the room. This is the classic uh, cocktail party phenomena. So, how do you do that? 
Well, one very potent and interesting way is to use what's called non-negative matrix factorization. So over there on the right, we've got a spectrogram. This is a sound spectrogram, time moving along here, frequency in the vertical axis, and there's a uh, color code, temperature code for the amplitude. So you can think of this matrix as being the product of two matrices, one operating in the time domain, which is up here, and the other in the spectral domain. And then with a little bit of machine learning, you can separate out these or do this factorization, factor the spectrogram into the two uh, sources, if you will, uh, and separate them. And this is working actually quite, quite, uh, quite well. So we've tried to get our, I'm sure you've heard in this in the boot camp that uh, we're really trying to get uh, uh, some design patterns into this work that uh, will help us out. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to go on too much longer. Uh, I, I will uh, simply say that uh, uh, progress is being made, but it's harder than we thought. Uh, one of the uh, things that um, we're working on intently right now is we want to have a data flow-like language that we can design signal processing graphs with, and then we want to analyze these graphs and map them to parallel architectures. What's hard about all this are the, all the sorts of dependencies that can happen and the fact that in live performance, people are introducing all sorts of new data dependencies are occurring on the fly, so we need to do a lot of this work in a dynamic manner. So uh, we, we have a, a lot to do, uh, but it's a very exciting area, and what I think is important about it is that the demands are so severe in terms of timing and performance that it's a very good vehicle to see how that it'll have an effect on the responsiveness and the sort of snappiness of computing in many domains. If we can solve these scheduling problems here, uh, I think we'll provide a lot of uh, uh, snappiness to other application areas. So I think I'll, it's kind of an overview of some of the things we're about, and uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. So let's thank all the thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much all for attending. And there are a lot of people to say thank you to, certainly all the speakers, Microsoft and Intel for helping support all of this activity, the teaching assistants in the back row who ran all the hands-on sessions, and the staff who, who made them work, and uh, Tammy and Roxana who helped organize all these things. So let's give them all a big round of applause.